Hi, everyone, and welcome to another podcast on workforce health and health literacy. My name is Seth Serksner. I'm the Chief Health Officer at EdLogix, and I'm so excited today to welcome a friend of mine and someone that I have been working with for more than 20 years. Carol Mendoza is the Vice President of Benefits at Voya Financial, and Carol, you know, you and I, as I just said, we've known each other a long time. I've followed your career path, but maybe give the audience a little bit of your background and how you've kind of wound up where you are today in this really, really exciting role at Voya. Yeah. Thank you, Seth. And yes, now I feel older than dirt. It, well, <laughs> over 20 years. My goodness. Yeah. So how did I get here? I think like so many benefits people, I fell into my work in this role. I started out as an admin at one of the consulting firms, one of the big consulting firms, and moved on to become an analyst and then a consultant, then quickly moved over to the employer side and really never looked back. So over 20 years in benefits, I am merely on the health side at first, but then started taking on retirement and then global responsibility. So I've worked in oil and gas, in tech big tech, and now am at Voya Financial, which is financial services and insurance. And we just acquired Benefit Focus. So some exciting work to do there too. I just finished my MPH, Master's in Public Health. And so very aligned with the exciting work that we're trying to do at Voya. Oh, congratulations. We're definitely going to have to talk about that as well. We've stayed in touch throughout all your moves. And it always, in hindsight, maybe looks like there was a plan, <laughs> <laughs> but because you were in some very interesting roles and maybe each of those got you to the next role, were you always kind of thinking about something that was the kind of place you wanted to work and the kind of role and contribution you wanted to make, or was it just a little bit of luck? I think a little bit of both. I have always been interested in going someplace where I could have an impact where I could do something interesting. And it can be difficult once you get to the senior job in benefits to continue to grow with the same company. In my most recent role, which Knockwood will be my last, coming out of the pandemic, I had really thought about my priorities and what's really important to me. And Boya absolutely checked all of the boxes. We have a social conscience. Our CEO, or now our former CEO, had written about the murder of George Floyd and how companies needed to step up. We have a strong purpose that flows through everything we do. Together, we fight for everyone's opportunity for a better financial future. And that is very much aligned with my own personal thinking and where I focus my efforts including education. So yeah, a little bit of happenstance, some thoughtful decisions, and it's ultimately gotten me here, which I, I couldn't be more delighted. Yeah, I appreciate that because people who are listening, I mean, I think benefits is an interesting kind of position in organizations. It's becoming, uh, thankfully, a very strategic role, but at times maybe you feel like you top out and if you have to move on or it maybe make a new role and my relationship with you has oftentimes been as a consultant, and you have always challenged us. You've always wanted to innovate, always not necessarily accepted the status quo, and we've had fun trying to push the envelope together. So speaking of Voya and that purpose and some of the things that you mentioned and that mission around you know, kind of helping people get financial well-being, talk about some of the big things you're doing at Voya and in the benefit space and how you're helping your own people as well as the community. Yeah, it's a good point you make about community because we do focus on three pillars, our customers, our colleagues, and our community. So we've been doing some great stuff in the benefit space, and I'll talk about that in a sec. But we also do a lot of work around DEI and have focused work streams where high potential employees are brought in to think about how we can impact our colleagues, our community, and our customers in different segments. So we had a Black African American work stream. We're just wrapping up our Hispanic Latino work stream. And while some of the challenges are the same, we want to make sure that we don't make assumptions about what the challenges are in some underserved communities. 
And so, so these are kind of career path, mentorship, kind of leadership, sponsorship kind of things you're talking about? That kind of program or project can come out of these. But what we do is look at the challenges for underserved communities, again, in those cohorts. I and see. what can we, Boya, do to help support our customers, our colleagues, and our community in addressing health and wealth inequity that may exist? Yeah, 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 lots of good research that we've done, particularly about around retirement and savings, because that's historically really been our business and demonstrating that we have lower participation rates, lower savings rates, lower account balances among our Black and Hispanic colleagues, which is very typical for other employers as well in our book of business and elsewhere. We strive for our own employees to help address those issues. You know, financial education is certainly part of it, but also you know, one issue that we identified was crippling student loan debt and also the inability to pursue higher education because even though we have a strong tuition reimbursement program, that still required an upfront payment with reimbursement on the back end. So a couple of things that we did last year were to introduce student loan repayment program where we combined, we have a combined cap for tuition reimbursement and student loan reimbursement where up to $5,250 a year tax-free is available to you to pursue your education wow. or to pay off student loans in the past. Yeah, again, it's tax-free and in addition to anything that you pay on your own. But also on the right. tuition reimbursement, and I mentioned the upfront cash payment we now have a program where if the college or university will accept it, we will extend a letter of credit for the employee. So $5,000 a year, you don't have to come up with that money up front. We pay it up front. And Carol, is that something that just Voya is doing or is that a program you offer to other employers? This is just your own thing, right? It's our own thing. We don't offer tuition reimbursement programs today as a product. Although I wouldn't count us out, we're finding all kinds of opportunities to address workplace benefits. But for now, it's something that we're doing for our employees. Got it. Got it. Just because as people are listening and thinking, maybe we could yeah. do it at our company, how, you know, they're looking for resources or whether they build it themselves. So, and, yeah. And our tuition reimbursement partner is able to support that. So if you have a tuition reimbursement program in place mm -hmm. now, certainly something that you can address with your administrator. Yeah, incredible. So these work streams are kind of trying to better understand the issues related to these different underserved groups and then yes. come up with solutions, as you mentioned, maybe around. So anything around savings and retirement? I mean, the education yeah. and debt, of course. Anything in that space? Everybody would love us to have an emergency fund and start to yeah. build a savings account. Yeah. So we are focused on health and wealth equity. And my feeling is that if we can help employees optimize their health care decisions, their health insurance decisions, or where they go for care, we can free up some money that is then available to put into an emergency savings account, to put into an HSA if someone is enrolled in an HSA compatible plan, or to put into the 401k. That requires some education, and Boya has started developing a tool and we launched it internally and are slowly rolling it out with customers where employees go through the traditional decision support tool that you get around annual enrollment, but we don't stop with the health plan decision. We then say, okay, you've made these decisions. Now, if you have some extra money, and what do you do? What's the next best dollar? If you haven't achieved your 401k match yet, you know, contribute to the 401k. Well, if you don't have an emergency savings plan, that's the first place to go. But are you getting your 401k match? Once you get to your 401k match, okay, maybe the HSA is the best option for you because of the triple tax savings. And so putting that all in one place and then something that we did last year, and I can't take any credit for this, it's a Voya product, but able to pull in other financial data as well. So your other retirement accounts that you may have someplace else, your credit card information so that you have a true picture of everything, all of your benefits and all of your financial savings 
in one dashboard and then get timely alerts. You know, did you know you have a subscription to this thing and the subscription is about to come due? Do you still want that subscription? So little things that you can do to chip away at some of the extra money that you may be spending that you don't need to. You know, I love this. For years now, as wellness expanded to well-being, this category of financial well-being became forefront for everyone. And yeah. let's face it, if you're worried about making ends meet or putting food on the table, you're not thinking about drinking seven glasses of water a day or getting more steps in at work, yeah. right? So this financial well-being and the relationship to health and well-being is kind of been out there, but people trying to figure out quite how to do it. I guess the financial literacy, we've talked a little yeah. bit about that in the past, but like you said, it's you're walking people through this, but how do you help people really with their financial literacy and budgeting and all those kind of classic pieces? Are you in that, doing some of that for the at yeah. least colleague piece? Yes, we have started some of that. Voya as a 401k administrator has a lot of great tools and we have our Voya financial advisors, but we also needed something that could address issues that were more basic. So there is financial education about how do you budget? What are some of the things that you need to consider when you are, you know, let's think about 401k loans. You know, what are some of the other options that you could pursue before you get to the loan or the hardship withdrawal? Again, the idea of I have $10 to spend. Where should I put that money that's going to have the most benefit? I think that sort of thing is really important. And I think back to financial wellness or education that we may have talked about 10, 15, 20 years ago and how almost condescending it could be because mm -hmm. the idea was, okay, if you don't have your Starbucks every day, well, then you can take that money and put it into your retirement plan. People who are living paycheck to paycheck are probably not spending the $3 on the Starbucks every day. It's a trade-off between you know, getting the prescription and putting food on the table. So we need to be much more thoughtful in our education about the real challenges that people are facing so that we can grab their attention and help them solve the particular issues that they're struggling with. I love the compassion in that and the appreciation. As we've discussed in the past, especially during COVID, I focused and many of us focused on social determinants of health or social essentials. And we came to the realization that even though you get a paycheck every week and maybe have benefit coverage, you can still be lacking in some of these areas yeah. and very concerned. And so to your point, and I love this work streams again, that really understand what are the real issues here, right? It's not about, you know, skipping a Starbucks. It's about putting gas in the tank or whatever it may yeah. be. So, you know, and we've talked a little bit about this, and I love that you're making the link between health and wealth. And this podcast, we talk about health literacy. Yeah. And for me, this health literacy has kind of been, like you say, the old health literacy has maybe been kind of like the wealth health literacy was very condescending. It was like a brochure and maybe a little drawing. And we're talking about this concept of 2.0 that uses behavioral science and data and personalization yeah. and videos to really elevate the idea because the literature, again, would suggest that only one out of 10 people is health literate, can really navigate this complicated health journey and system and all the information. And yet it's highly related to better outcomes and positive behaviors. So I'm curious, I hear from a lot of employers, yes, Seth, great idea, really important, <laughs> but it's not a diabetes program or it's not a weight management program or, you know, it just doesn't fit into my box. So I don't know how to do it. Where do you think health literacy fits? Am I just out there on the edge or is it just too hard to fit in the ecosystem? Or I think you're closer to playing this out a little bit, but what are your thoughts on that topic? I think that health literacy is incredibly important. And when we look at our data to see, again, how underserved populations are using the healthcare system, we see lower rates of PCP engagement, fewer preventive visits, more ER usage, just not optimizing health benefits, not understanding or knowing where to go. And I think that employers tried to address some of the cost increases 
in the system, you know, 10, 15 years ago with high deductible health plans. And we expected that everyone was going to be a better consumer and learn how to navigate the system better. It hasn't worked. I personally love HSAs and the triple tax savings. Well, and the literature shows that not only are we avoiding unnecessary care, we're avoiding necessary care too. And for those who are in high deductible plans who are less well compensated or who live in areas that are, you know, healthcare deserts, they need some help navigating and finding the right resources. And that starts with education and knowing the important steps that you need to take to be healthy. And then linking back to you know, my passion around health and wealth, if you're spending more for healthcare now, that's less that's available for sure. savings and retirement. Yeah. And then similarly, if you are less healthy now and deferring care and not taking care of yourself as an active employee, you are going to have higher health care costs in retirement. So more of that precious nest egg that you've saved will go to health care expenses. So there are things about the wealth piece mm -hmm. that are not tied to health, but I think the better job you can do of taking care of your health now, understanding how to navigate the system, understanding what you need to do can help you in retirement in so many ways. So maybe that's a little bit of a good motivational message to the colleagues, as you say, to say, look, you know, it will help you now, but it will help you later <laughs> if you yeah. start to take care of your health. And if you kind of make some of these informed decisions, I guess the question just as you raised was when we went to HSAs, but even before that, and all through it, we put a pretty big burden on the individual and the family yeah. to figure this out. And we've done a bunch of, I call them stop gaps. There are a number of good advocacy companies out there and health plans try to do some of that, but it's a real hand-holding thing, not a teach a person to fish yeah. kind of story. Are you seeing either at Voya or just in the industry that there's some renewed interest? I just, I see a little bit of beefed up benefit decision-making at open yeah. enrollment, but I'm still not seeing the focus that I would have imagined. Yeah, I think where in the past we might have put more burden on the patient and required the patient to navigate, you know, it may not be teaching to fish, but being more directive. So PCP first medical plan options, narrower networks trying to drive not only to lower cost, because I think narrow networks in the past have driven to lower cost, not that they haven't cared more about the outcomes, but it was more difficult to measure. I think the latest iteration of these narrow networks are focused on outcomes, which is, you know, quality the overall lower cost because of higher quality. But those are, it's narrowing the choices rather than encouraging people to do research on their own. I think patients might appreciate what employers are doing in those kinds of plans better if they were better educated about the healthcare system and understood why those decisions are being made. Did you know that with labs and imaging, you can save money by it's exactly. pretty vanilla mm -hmm. product, right? And yeah. you can save hundreds of dollars by going you know, a mile down the road. So there are opportunities. There are products out there that are very focused to help employees get there, but paired with appropriate education, I think employees may value those options that their employers are offering and happier employees, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. It's so interesting because I was talking to some people actually from Google who also own YouTube and YouTube is the second most popular search engine on the internet. Yeah. And one of the number one top things that people search are health topics. So if you're going in for a knee surgery or anything, you YouTube what that's going to look like. How come we are not, and this is kind of rhetorical, I think there should be more video like YouTube, like teaching around yeah. health issues so that people could understand better. Cause that's how we all learn. We learn in a 90 second YouTube, but 
hopefully we can incorporate some of that to help people understand, just like you said, what's the difference of quality and going to one place versus another and it could save you money at the same time. Yeah. So Carol, this has been great. People are out there listening to this, absorbing this. If you just had a few recommendations for people that are trying to, again, help their own colleagues and community and customers, both on the health and wealth literacy and well-being space, what are some of the big things that you have found helpful or that you're still working on that you would kind of focus people towards? Yeah, I think it's really important to look at subpopulations within your employee population. Benefits by design are offered broadly to your entire workforce, but that doesn't mean that there can't be tweaks to plan design to help address issues that exist for you know, some groups within your employee population. So a couple of examples of things that Voya did last year that are around the edges, but still help to support employees after we looked at our data, we're covering doulas under the medical plan because we know that maternal outcomes can be much better, especially for our African-American colleagues when doulas are available and in the room. We're covering gender affirmation treatment all the way through all of the WPATH guidelines. You know, it's a small segment of the population, but it has a tremendous impact. And then we're covering behavioral health that is out of network as if it were in network to help address access issues. So again, back to the idea of digging another level down in the data to understand the particular challenges of sub-segments of your population so that you can address those issues through plan design. And final suggestion is on the health side, look at not only the plan cost and what your employees are paying for premiums, but also their total out-of-pocket exposure. Because once you start looking at how much employees are paying for coverage in total, not just the premium, but their coinsurance, their deductibles, I think you can have a greater appreciation for, again, those issues of living paycheck to paycheck and can start to help educate again about how you could optimize those benefits, maybe make different choices that will benefit their paycheck in the future. So helpful. And if people didn't notice, Carol is all about the data. So <laughs> she starts almost all of her comments with the data <laughs> or the literature or whatever. So I appreciate that. I really, again, reminding us about subpopulations, a lot of people are focused on age bands, which yeah. is another way to think about it. But we are also, to your point, whether it's race, ethnicity, gender preference, all these different kind of subgroups, so important. And then total cost of care. Absolutely. Yeah. How are we doing on total cost of care? And yes, the employer burden is important to the employer, but it's also important to everyone, the total cost. So yeah. great insights, Carol. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time and I just feel so lucky to reconnect with you. So thanks for sharing all that today. Yep. Delighted to chat with you. Thanks, Seth. Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen.